Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Physics Department at the Colorado School of Mines. My name's Eric. And I'm Nicole. Last time we developed a relation between our wave vector Q and the frequency of oscillations in a solid called the dispersion relation. Although we plotted omega over all values of Q, only certain values of Q will result in something physically reasonable. Today we're going to look at what those values are and how to get phase and group velocity information from our dispersion relation. Recall we defined our displacement for a particular atom at position n as a plane wave like so. Let's begin by looking at the ratio of displacements between atom n and its neighbor at position n plus 1. So after some canceling, we end up with e to the i qa. And to cover the whole unit circle, qa would need to be between minus pi and pi. So q would be between minus pi over a and pi over a. And minus pi over a to pi over a is the first Brillouin zone, right? Yeah. Mathematically speaking, there's no point in saying two atoms are out of phase by 1.2 pi because a phase difference of minus 0.8 pi gives us the same ratio for the displacement of the atom at position n plus 1 over the displacement of atom at position n. But then what if we have a q vector outside this range? Do we just ignore it and only look at those inside the first Brillouin zone? Well, we could, but instead we could shift q by our reciprocal vectors until it was in the right range. To see this, Let's go back to our original displacement ratio and multiply by e to the i 2 pi n and e to the minus i 2 pi n. e to the i 2 pi n would just be 1 since n is an integer, so we can scratch that. But now we have this other exponential. Right, but now let's define a new wave vector q prime that equals q minus 2 pi n over a. Hmm, 2 pi over a is the magnitude of our g vector in 1d. So this q prime is just our original q minus an integer value of our reciprocal lattice. If we plug that back into this term here, we have the same form as the original ratio. So this new q prime is equivalent to a q vector already inside the first Brillouin zone. So I see how this works mathematically. But say I had a wave vector q at pi over a and one at 3 pi over a. This one corresponds to a wavelength of 2a and the other 2a over 3. You keep saying they're physically equivalent, but I'm just not seeing it. So it turns out the fact that our lattice is a discrete set of points is the key to all of this. Let's draw our 1d lattice and overlay the 2a wavelength. Each atom sits at a peak or a trough as we've seen before. Now let's look at the same lattice with the wavelength 2a over 3. The atoms still sit at peaks and troughs, so they experience the same out-of-phase motion that they did with the other wave. Okay, so that's how two different wave vectors can give the same physical result. So really, one should think about this as a visual representation of the Nyquist frequency. And what's that? Think about electronically sampling a wave. At some period, you're only going to be able to sample peaks and troughs. What happens as that period gets even shorter? You wouldn't be able to sample as much of the wave, and would probably not get the correct information on it. Indeed, and the frequency that you can't sample above, because you'd get something wrong, is the Nyquist frequency. Okay, so in our case, the atoms in our crystal can only support waves with wavelengths as short as 2a. Anything less than that has no physical meaning, but can be shifted into an equivalent Q vector in the first Brillouin zone, where it does have meaning. Nicole, you've absolutely nailed it. And so that's why dispersions are only plotted from Q equals minus pi over A to pi over A. Okay, that's all I'd like to say about Nyquist frequency and the first Brillouin zone at the moment. And this brings us to part two of today's screencast, 
finding phase and group velocities from our dispersion. Well, what's the difference between the two? Let's consider the phase velocity first, which is the distance that the phase of the wave moves over a given amount of time. To make things easier, we're just going to look at one oscillation. Okay, so the distance is just our wavelength lambda, and our time would just be the period t. So our phase velocity is lambda over t? Yeah, but let's move some things around. We know that k is 2 pi over lambda, and that the period is 2 pi over the angular frequency of the wave. Now what do we get? Omega over k. Well, what about the group velocity then? Isn't that also the amount of distance over time? Almost. We can think of our waves in terms of phase and group velocities. Consider adding together two waves of the following form. Now if we define our k1, k2, and omega1, omega2 variables as so, we can plug these back in. That looks really ugly. Why are we doing this? Just bear with me for a second. Through the magic of trig, we can rewrite these two equations in the following form, where this term describes the inner wave, and this term describes the traveling wave packet. Then which one goes with the phase and group velocities? Well, what do you think? Well, I know that the phase velocity is omega over k. Oh, so that's going to be this term here. So then this other term corresponds to the group velocity. Going back to our dispersion then, does that mean that all of our phonons have different group velocities? Looks like it's a good time for a recap. Today we found q values between minus pi over a and pi over a will give us physically significant waves within our dispersion. Then we used our dispersion to find the phase and group velocities of our wave. Before we end today's video, it'd be a good idea to plot waves with frequencies higher than the Nyquist frequency and try to convince yourself you can get the same result by a wave shifted by a 2 pi over a. All right, thanks for watching today's solid state physics in a nutshell. Next time, Eric and I will be looking at quantizing vibrations in a lattice. See you then.